Good morning to all of you, uh, presumably most of you in Minnesota. I am dialing in from Northwest Washington in a little coastal town called Port Townsend. And I have rural broadband that is not very good. So I'm hoping that if there are any problems this morning that um, one of you will text me on my phone and let me know. But I will proceed here and to begin with, I won't say much about the Xerces Society other than um, I am one of the directors of our pollinator conservation work at Xerces and uh, also work across um, sort of the agricultural spectrum on beneficial insect conservation as well as pollinators. And going back four or five years ago, I got the idea that we should be working on soil invertebrates as well. That said, there are probably, oh, 50 or 55 staff members at Xerces, and of them, probably 50 or 54 of them know more about soils and soil invertebrates than I do. And yet, uh, here I am this morning. So I am. Uh, I'm taking a plunge here and hoping that my brain is sufficiently wrapped around the, the content. Uh, but I won't say more about Xerces. I know Sarah and Karen have a tremendous amount of good content covered here for the summit and they can, they can touch on more of the full spectrum of what we do. But I will say that um, we occupy an interesting position as a wildlife conservation NGO. We work on these animals that um, in many ways are overlooked in traditional conservation efforts, but of course have this, this, this incredibly important role in the functioning of our planet. And I'm gonna focus specifically on soil invertebrate life today. And of course, these are the animals that are oftentimes playing essential roles in the decomposition and creation of soil organic matter. These are animals that play a very large and yet widely under-recognized role in soil carbon sequestration. These are animals that move a tremendous amount of earth every year. And these are animals that are the base of terrestrial and aquatic food webs. They are the, the primary food sources for things like fish and songbirds. Um, so we at Xerces have been able to build a, a pretty interesting conservation program and, and conservation project around the protection of these animals. And of course, we know that these are, are hugely uh, representative of the diversity of life on earth and that we as mammals occupy, occupy only the slimmest uh, little subset of biological diversity on the planet. So to begin with, we mostly, I think intuitively recognize that when you dig through your garden soil or if you're looking in uh, prairie soils that these soils are really rich with biological diversity and with animal life. And for context, we know that around a quarter of all globally recognized or identified biodiversity is, is life that lives within the soil. We have these really powerful and I think interesting uh, statistics to benchmark this understanding. We know, for example, that a typical square meter of native prairie soil will, will contain thousands of invertebrate animals, and that even a single square foot of native prairie soil, um, we oftentimes talk about the, the fact that it it likely contains more living organisms than the entire above ground Amazon forest ecosystem. Now the insects and other invertebrates in the soil can, can range from those that live upon the soil surface, but they can also include species that are found very, very deeply within the soil profile, many feet down in the soil profile. 
And some of these, and if you think about the, the case of cicadas or some of the, the ground beetles, these, these can be extremely long lived invertebrates. So I'll give you sort of a, just a quick snapshot of some of that biological diversity. And much of this is gonna be readily familiar to all of you. Ants, of course, are uh, probably the, the easiest and most readily identifiable soil organism for many of us because they're the animals that we grew up with. When you're out playing in your sandbox as a kid or exploring the forest or exploring sidewalks, these, these small ecosystem engineers are, are likely the most abundant arthropods in our soil. And, and that's why we've come to, to immediately recognize them. I've got a, a four-year-old, recent, recently four years old, who um, even at the youngest age knew what an ant was. He may not have been able to recognize the difference between a camel and a giraffe, but um, ants were part of his everyday world and, and uh, as they are for many of us. But we know that collectively the force that these animals are exerting on the landscape around us is tremendous. And in a typical pasture setting uh, or, or not pesticide laden farm setting, we think that these ants are typically moving something on the order of multiple tons of soil per acre per year on that individual small ant basis. So it's a remarkable impact that they have. And as I go through these uh, profiles here, we'll bring this full circle and talk about how the, there's this nexus between soil life and habitat restoration and this nexus between soil life and pollinators as well. But another group of species that are found in the soil um, and I'm sort of beginning at the largest groups and working my way down are the predatory ground beetles. And these are the tigers or lions of the insect world. These are animals that are oftentimes nocturnal. They're oftentimes um, sight hunters. They're running down prey, whether it's caterpillars or slugs in the leaf litter on the soil. We know that some of these predatory ground beetles can live for years. We know that they, much like big cats, we know that they are um, sometimes prone to killing more prey insects than they can possibly consume. So they're really quite ruthless predators in that regard. But there are other ground beetles that are feeding on plant tissue or seeds and there's been some interesting work in the Midwest in recent years looking at the role of these seed feeding beetles. And this is one of the places where I think there's a nexus between restoration, habitat restoration, and um, soil invertebrates. It's an interesting fact, which is that many of our seed feeding beetles preferentially feed on um, prolific reseeding annuals. And if you think about what that means in a restoration context, that is oftentimes our annual weeds, the, the things like pigweed or ragweed that can be really aggressive in disturbed sites. And we know that these seed feeding beetles can consume hundreds of seeds in a 24 or 48 hour period. And consequently, our in many cases providing an outsized role in weed suppression. And yet we, we hardly recognize that we're getting this service from them. Sticking with beetles for a moment, um, Sarah mentioned ground be or dung beetles uh, in her previous presentation uh, with, with a tiger beetle attempting to take one of these down. Uh, brown, dung beetles were historically associated with, with native grazing animals, bison. We, of course, have dung beetles in pasture systems with domestic livestock, but oftentimes these 
are rare or missing in a lot of livestock operations because of uh, pesticides or deworming agents that are fed to livestock that reduce these dung beetle populations. But we know that at a global level, these are contributing to the re reduction of methane gas emissions on a, a pretty substantial level. Um, from a food security standpoint in agricultural systems, especially in the developing world, these are really important animals for reducing animal waste across the landscape. But if we keep scanning the broad spectrum of soil invertebrates, we see that there's even more out there that these airborne insects that we typically associate with the skies or with the flower with flowers around us things like moths and flies are oftentimes living out part of their life cycle and often the largest or longest part of their life cycle in the soil and this includes many different fly species, um, flies that's, that feed on dung or carrion or decaying vegetation, but also parasitic flies, flies that lay their eggs in the nests of ground dwelling insects like, like bees, uh, where their larva will hatch and feed upon that, that, that host. Um, there are various moth species that spend a substantial part of their uh, larval stage in the ground feeding on plant tissue or uh, roots of plants. Um, and of course, bees as well are, are disproportionately represented um, at a global level by ground nesting species. The majority of ground nesting species, the majority of our 20,000-ish species of wild bees on earth are these ground nesting species that um, can nest several feet into the ground that in some cases are adapted to nesting in seasonally flooded landscapes. Uh, these, these are bees that that are part of that larger soil community of, of invertebrates. If we scan away from insects, we see that there are also spiders, especially wolf spiders and ground nesting spider or, or ground spiders that are uh, part of that soil matrix. There are centipedes, most of which are predators. And then there are these kin animals, the, the harvest men or daddy long legs and millipedes, which tend to lean more towards the, the herbivore or detritivore end of the spectrum, feeding largely on dead vegetation and, and fungi and rotting plant tissue. Uh, there are also crustaceans that are found in the soil. And I am, as you can tell by the amount of text on the slide, somewhat partial to wood lice or pill bugs as a, a kind of a fascinating soil animal, sort of a fascinating animal in general. There are at least 4,000 known species of wood lice on the planet, and yet we think there's probably potentially twice as many out there that nobody has identified down to a, a, a new species level. These are animals that are out there feeding on tiny fungal spores, rust spores of uh, rust fungi, dead vegetation. Uh, what's fascinating to me is that the closest living relatives of wood lice are marine crustaceans. And um, some of you I'm sure have heard about the, the importance of uh, whale biomass in the ocean and it's living here on the coast. This is something people talk about a lot here, how when whales die, they sink to the bottom and there are all of these animals that come to feed on it. Well, in, in the ocean, the, the closest relatives of these wood lice are some of the earliest feeders on those sunken whale carcasses. And the marine equivalents are, about uh, 12 to 14 inches in size and have really voracious appetites. 
So our wood lice, the fact that they've migrated from the deepest depths of the ocean to these species that live on land, it's kind of a remarkable story. And we see this legacy in the, in the, the biology of wood lice or, or pill bugs, even the ones you find in your basement at home in, in Minnesota. There are animals that have blue blood, uh, copper-based blood, unlike an iron-based blood, which is um, representative of marine animals. These are small animals that are carrying their young around in a little pouch, like a marsupial. Um, so very, very fascinating and oftentimes dependent on damp environments and very easy, uh, it's very easy for them to dry out as well. So very different from insects, even though we oftentimes lump them together with, with other, um, with insects or other types of terrestrial arthropods. They are a very, very different type of animal in our soil. If we move down the scale of size away from insects and these larger animals, what we call the macrofauna of the soil, there are the mesofauna, these smaller animals, the animals that are just sort of barely visible to the naked eye. And these are things like mites, which range from uh, detritivores or things that are feeding on fungi or bacteria to parasites of other insects. Um, out here where I live, there are even mite parasites of slugs that live on the, on the soil. You'll see the slugs moving along the soil. And if you look closely, you'll see these little tiny mites racing around on their bodies. Um, there are uh, potworms in this mesofauna group. If we move even further down the spectrum, though, to the really, really small animals, the microscopic animals, we're then in the scale of things like nematodes and springtails, which you might be seeing right now as um, the snow fleas, the little tiny, uh, the little, little tiny arthropods that you might see bouncing around on crusty uh, soil surfaces or sun snow surfaces in late winter in Minnesota. Um, this category of animals would include things like rotifers and tardigrades. Um, tardigrades, the, the soil bears, as they're sometimes called, these tiny little animals that are among the, the greatest survivors on earth that can withstand enormous heating, that can withstand enormous cold temperatures, um, they can withstand desiccation. There was the, the recent story of the, uh, I think it was an Israeli space probe that brought uh, tardigrades to the surface of the moon as um, sort of a, a experiment in tardigrade survival. Um, very, very fascinating little animals. Uh, and then, of course, there are protozoa in this group, which um, arguably are no longer classified as animals, but were historically considered single-celled animals and have the ability to, um, to move their modal animals in, in many cases. And then the last one, I'll, the last group of animals here that I'll just briefly touch on before moving the conversation out to discuss um, some principles of soil health and sort of the nexus between soil animals and habitat restoration. Um, the last group of animals here that I'll mention are just the earthworms, which we oftentimes think of as a benchmark of soil health. Um, I know many farmers who are really proud of themselves when they go out in their, their cover crop soils and see all these earthworms that are churning the soil and mixing uh, organic matter and facilitating decomposition. And yet in most um, areas of North America that were previously glaciated, we don't have native terrestrial earthworms. Um, we do have some native aquatic uh, worms, but in most situations we we historically did not have any native uh, terrestrial earthworms. 
And so there are these concerns about the, the impact that these worms are having on things like prairies and forests where they are altering ecosystems by depleting leaf litter and really changing the vegetative communities of those, those natural areas. So with sort of that very brief and casual overview of some of what's out there living in our soils, I wanted to, to turn the conversation towards um, our understanding of these animals in the context of both agriculture and in the context of conservation and habitat restoration. And I'll just spend a few moments here talking about agriculture specifically. We are experiencing what I would call a sort of soil health renaissance in this country. And within the sustainable agriculture world, there's a huge amount of conversation taking place around soil health and this notion of regenerative agriculture. There's a very strong interest in soil biology for the first time in decades. And yet much of that conversation is really focused on the microbiology of soils. It's focused on root exudates and glomalin and bacteria and fungal networks and the animals that are also part of that, that ecosystem really are not getting very much attention. And I hope that conversations like this help change that situation. But despite that, this, this interest in soil health, I think, is a really positive development. And there are a number of different ways of defining soil health, but much of it boils down to these core principles of protecting the soil uh, by minimizing disturbance, by maximizing soil cover, especially soil cover throughout, the, throughout all four seasons. Um, Part of that conversation also tends to focus on feeding the life in the soil by maximizing continuous living roots within the soil and maximizing biodiversity in those soils. And we know that these principles do have a, a measurable real world impact. So one of the tools that we've developed at Xerces recently is what we call a soil scouting or soil life scouting protocol. And this is a pretty simplistic tool that we are using to just measure the, the abundance and diversity of, of animals, soil dwelling animals that you might find on a soil surface in a variety of landscapes. So this is a snapshot of what, of the differences that we can see in this soil scouting exercise. A colleague of mine last summer uh, was doing this in, in different parts of Indiana. And I thought this was an interesting comparison of some different landscape types. So here she is, she's put these pitfall traps in the soil to capture animals that are sort of running across the soil surface and fall into these traps where they can be observed. Uh, and these are just buried plastic cups in the soil. But at the top, you can see this pitfall trap in a cultivated agricultural soil right in the middle of a crop field in September of last year. And there is very little, um, very little animal life found in that pitfall trap on the top here. There's a few of those springtails, a few of the ants, uh, but moving out of the crop field to this mowed ditch here in the middle photo, uh, you can see just this mowed embankment of, of non-native turf grass. There's a little bit more. There's a few crickets in this pitfall trap. And then moving even further away from the crop field out into this buffer area that has native vegetation in it, you end up with a number of you end up with quite a few more crickets as well as a, a number of other animals that are found in these pitfall traps. And of course, this is all intuitive to us. We all recognize sort of regardless of our training and experience in, uh, 
in habitat management, we all recognize that that native plant communities are the accelerants of biological diversity. So to create analogs for that effect, we need to really think about how we can apply these principles, especially of, of continuous cover of plant diversity and maximizing biodiversity. And one of the ways that farmers are increasingly doing this is through the use of cover crops. Um, cover crops being the plants that you plant between rotations of things like corn and soybean um, over the winter or over the spring months um, that, that can be essentially used as green manures in many cases and, and um, killed off to provide additional soil organic matter and nutrients back to the soil. We tend to see the greatest impact on soil animal diversity where these cover crops are crafted from multiple species, from a variety of different species, you know, maybe a mixture of oats and legumes of different kinds. Uh, we see that these are these cover crops, especially the diverse cover crops, also tend to increase wild bee populations. We know from research done by um, uh, a couple of folks in Indiana that cover crops increase the consumption of weed seed by those uh, seed feeding ground beetles. So you're getting multiple benefits beyond just agricultural benefits from the use of these cover crops. Still, we, especially at Xerces, have been really interested in how this concept could be taken a few steps further through the use of native plants as cover crops. And there's been very little work done around this, but some of the emerging work um, and work that's being done by Xerces staff is looking at the use of partridge pea as a, a, a possible future cover crop tends to be a little bit too expensive to be widely used, but it's this aggressive annual uh, native legume that puts on a tremendous amount of biomass and is very attractive to insects. On the west coast, we have Lacey Facelia, which is a native western wildflower that is already widely used as a cool season cover crop and is just a prolific, uh, prolific nectar producer. With cover crops, Early on, there was oftentimes the use of glyphosate or Roundup as a tool for terminating them or getting rid of them and, and clearing the, the site for um, replanting in crops. Um, more recently, there's been work around uh, tools to, to sort of crimp and flatten the cover crops and prepare an area for planting. But now we're seeing farmers adopting the use of livestock increasingly as a way to, to terminate the cover crops. So you plant this between your cash crops, you let it grow up and produce some biomass and increase the insect abundance and diversity and soil life in a farm ecosystem. And then you turn the cattle loose or the sheep loose on it to, to essentially graze it all down and prepare the area for planting. It's a really, really fascinating system where it works and one that has a uh, high potential to, to decrease the use of herbicides and agricultural chemicals. There are other ways that we see farmers trying to jointly increase um, insect diversity and abundance and uh, provide agricultural benefits. One of those is the use of beetle banks, these elevated berms. This is Grinnell Heritage Farm in Iowa that has created these beetle banks with native prairie grasses, things like Indian grass and little blue stem and big blue stem on these elevated rows between their vegetable crops. And I mentioned the predatory ground beetles, the little um, tigers or lions of the insect world that are out there running down prey at night um, slugs and other soft-bodied insects. And those nocturnal insects are looking for some refuge, some cover during the daytime. And these beetle banks provide that. And the elevated uh, structure of these also provide an ideal overwintering habitat for those ground beetles as well. They provide that grassy 
thatch that that the beetles can can essentially hunker down under in the winter time for cover. Prairie strips are another novel system that people are using to uh, reintegrate native plants back into farm systems. We have some concerns around the use of prairie strips in farms that are um, intensively using insecticides. Um, yet where that isn't the case or where insecticides are managed very judiciously, these have the potential to increase uh, biodiversity and also provide some, some tangible soil protection benefits. They reduce wind erosion across the landscape. They serve as sediment traps to capture uh, soil movement that might be generated by melting snow or rainwater. So they provide these multiple benefits. One last area here that really is not getting much of any attention in the conversation around soil health in agriculture right now is the insecticide issue. And this is unfortunate because we know that across the Midwestern landscape, one of the, the most readily identifiable sources of insecticides in soil and water systems are coming, that source is, is insecticide treated farm seed, corn and soy seed in particular. Mostly the insecticides we're concerned about right now are the neonicotinoid insecticides, uh, the synthetic nicotine-like compounds that are soluble in water that are persistent in soil for years. Um, some of you may have seen today's news across Minnesota, looking at the DNR's survey results of neonicotinoids found in the organs of white-tailed deers, uh, white-tailed white -tailed deer. Um, and uh, based on the survey results from this year's hunt or this year's harvest, it seems that neonicotinoids are present in the organs of, of deer almost entirely across the state. And there's concerns around how that's affecting the development of, of deer and other upland game species. And it should be a concern for how it's impacting our development as well. Interestingly, we don't even see a, a direct yield benefit from the use of these chemicals. In many cases, they're used prophylactically before we even can justify there's a pest presence on a farm. Um, and we're seeing this interesting cascade effect in some cases in parts of Ohio and Pennsylvania, particularly there's been just very deep and growing concerns around slug damage to soybean crops. And we think what has happened is that these insecticide treatments have poisoned the predatory ground beetles that would normally be controlling slugs in a crop like soybean. And now without those ground beetles present, we're getting these, these large pest outbreaks. So I'm gonna set aside the, the agricultural conversation and talk a little bit about the nexus between soil health and habitat restoration. And this topic alone is one that, you know, I, I really can't honestly do much justice to in even an hour long conversation. We could spend weeks talking about this, this part of the story alone. And, you know, I, I guess I would pose the question, does soil life or soil health matter for habitat restoration? Of course it does. Yet in most cases, we don't, we don't know how. We don't know the, the dynamics in any sort of um, significant or deep way. We know that when we plant native plants that, that animals, even soil animals show up and, and feed upon them. This is a, uh, the rhizome of a swamp milkweed plant. And you can see this longhorn beetle larva feeding within that plant, um, but we don't, no, we can go out and we can pull out milkweed plants where this is happening, but we know nothing about the nematodes that might be feeding on the, the longhorn beetles in the soil during this stage of their life. So we really have very few tools to help 
drive the system or to shape a habitat restoration in ways that maximize the utility of the animals that, that might be living in the soil. We know a little bit more about the role of mycorrhizal fungi and native plants. And uh, mycorrhizal fungi, for some context, the majority of terrestrial plant species on the planet have some association, some symbiotic association with mycorrhizal fungi where they will basically help the plant absorb nutrients from the soil and the plant is in, in exchange feeding food, feeding sugars back to these fungi. Through a number of experiments that various researchers have done over the past decade in particular, there's been quite a bit more uh, attention paid to this. We know that there, that remnant prairies show benefits in terms of plant establishment, plant growth, plant diversity, when there's some inoculation of, of those restored plants with, uh, with these mycorrhizal fungi. And yet we don't even know how this impacts the majority of the plant materials that we're actually using in most restoration projects. So all of that said, we know that soil life is having, in, in some cases, a beneficial impact on the success of restoration. Yet, we um, counterintuitively or ironically oftentimes get great restoration results when we obliterate everything in the soil. So how, how is this possible? Um, and for, uh, I guess, a, an understanding of the photos here on the screen, this is a solarization uh, project on a farm in California where we put down this high tunnel greenhouse plastic and bury the edges and let the soil heat this site to 150 degrees, killing all of the living things within the, the top few inches of soil, and then go in and overseed it with these native plants, and you get beautiful results. So how is this possible? We know this is the same in Minnesota. Many of you working on prairie restoration, I'm sure you know, you've had the same experience I do, where you plant prairie over what was previously Roundup Ready soybeans, and you get great results. So I think part of the story here is that just as native plants have soil animal and soil fun, fungi and soil bacteria that they're associated with, our weedy species also have their own associates. And what may be happening is that these really intensive um, and arguably destructive soil management practices are potentially obliterating those soil associates of the weedy species and essentially resetting the system um, in favor of, of native plants to take hold. Still, it's, um, I don't know if any of us are, are always quite satisfied with the scorched earth approach to habitat restoration. And so I think it's interesting to look at whether there are lessons we can learn from other parts of the world. Um, two of those stories that, that I follow closely that I'm really interested in is on the one hand, this concept of uh, what's called Korean natural farming, which is a system for cultivating or culturing indigenous um, soil fungi and bacteria and nematodes and small soil organisms and using that artificially cultured inoculum to assist uh, or using it as a soil amendment for um, areas of habitat restoration and areas of uh, agriculture, especially the agriculture based on native crop species. And this has gotten the uh, not a lot of attention in the United States, with the exception of the University of Hawaii that has had an active program around this um, Korean natural farming system and this artificial culturing of soil organisms um, for habitat restoration in Hawaii. 
Um, so if any of you are interested in this, you might check out some of the University of Hawaii publications on this. It's, it's fascinating. It uh, seems a little bit like equal parts um, voodoo and microbiology and alchemy. Uh, but I think, I think that there's clearly a basis in science to it as well, and one that we, we might be able to glean some important lessons from. Another of these restoration stories that tries to take a more holistic approach to the incorporation of uh, biodiversity into habitat creation is the concept of hay flower seeding that's used in Europe. And um, we have a colleague at Xerces, Stephanie Frischi, who has worked in the native seed industry in Europe and the United States, and uh, has really helped me understand the differences between the seed industry in both continents and the habitat restoration methods used in, mo in both continents. And it turns out that unlike the United States, where we're typically buying seed from a native seed producer, maybe putting it in a, in a seed drill and planting that, that PLS seed that we want all the specifications for. Um, the Europeans have taken a very different approach and instead they're harvesting biomass, they're harvesting green hay out of established high quality wildflower meadows and they're spreading that over prepared areas. Um, and that's what you see here in the lower right-hand corner. They, they spread this green hay with the concept that it has both the seeds in it, the shattering seeds in it that are gonna revegetate the site, but that this biomass also contains the, some of the fungi and bacteria from the, the original high quality donor site it includes some of the insect eggs and actual small living arthropods and in that biomass as well. So you're transplanting sort of a whole ecosystem as opposed to just planting seed in the soil. And I, I find it very, uh, very compelling and very interesting as an idea. Uh, there's also a nexus between habitat restoration and urban soils. And this is another area that we could spend a tremendous amount of time on. Urban soils, of course, are typically highly altered. They are soils that are oftentimes highly compacted. They have al um, altered hydrology, altered biology. They're oftentimes very alkaline from the constant leaching of concrete into the soil. In places like the Twin Cities, um, of course, salt is an issue as well in urban soils. And you can definitely see this on roadsides on I-94 through the Twin Cities. You see a very distinct plant community growing along the, the highway there because in part, um, it's a landscape that's, that's exposed to constant uh, road salt use. On the West Coast, we, we are um, very much more impacted by um, human and pet waste in, uh, in urban soils. And there's oftentimes whole, the, uh, remediation efforts that are required to, to work in these soils. Um, the, just the simple use of compost alone will oftentimes add a lot of nutrients to a soil, but it doesn't necessarily solve any of these underlying problems. Um, so urban soils are sort of their own special category uh, of, of area of expertise. Um, I've had personal experiences working in soils that were highly contaminated with with benzene and old uh, petroleum products in the Northwest that required an actual cap of clean soil over them. So there's a lot going on in urban soils that's very different from agricultural soils and different from, from prairie and uh, forest soils. And we know very little about the soil animals and soil life in urban soils. Despite that, um, we know that urban soils hold potentially huge 
potential. Uh, in 2016, there were a group of researchers looking at the impact of prairie gardens in, on soils in Madison, Wisconsin, and they found that these prairie gardens or prairie lawns, um, and this is actually my old house in Madison, Wisconsin, with one of these prairie gardens, uh, that these soils have significantly more organic matter, that they have less bulk density, they're easier to penetrate, that the water moves more easily between pores in those soils. So you're getting a lot of benefits in terms of potential soil carbon sequestration, you're getting benefits in terms of stormwater infiltration, you're, of course, not having to mow these um, constantly. So you get these stacked benefits from these urban soils. So despite all the challenges that they present, they are a, a huge opportunity to add nature back into the urban landscape. So I will um, just touch on a few additional resources here. I know this has been really high level and there's a huge amount here that we could all dig into in terms of specific topics, but just to point you to a few more tools and resources, um, I know Sarah and Karen will continue to direct all of you to our website where most of our publications are available as free downloads from, from the website. But we do have some soil specific tools. I mentioned the soil scouting protocol and we have a fact sheet on this that um, gives you the step-by-step -step, uh, instructions for performing your own soil scouting. If you're interested in replicating uh, experiments to, to see what kinds of abundance and diversity of soil organisms you might have, you, you should check that out. Uh, I touched on the cover cropping briefly as well, and we have a joint publication with SARE, the Sustainable Ag Research and Education branch of the National Institutes of Food and Agriculture. Um, we've got a cover crop uh, fact sheet for pollinators and beneficial insects, which, which you might check out as well. There are a number of great books out there on the things, the creatures that live in the soil. The United or the European Union recently came out with a uh, so soil biodiversity atlas, uh, which is this incredibly dense publication that will cover just about every nuance and aspect of, of soil diversity that you might be interested in. Um, something that's a little bit more approachable and really quite amazing in terms of its macro photography is this middle publication, The State of Knowledge of Soil Biodiversity. This is a, a document of the uh, United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. And then if you're interested in a, just a really approachable, um, fascinating read, one that um, I, I sometimes pick this book up and I look at it with my kids, um, is Life in the Soil by James Nardi, a professor at the University of Illinois. And um, I should point out that a lot of the content here in my presentation is gleaned from, from Dr. Nardi and um, his experience with this. He was uh, talking about soil life and the animals that live in the soil years ago before this had really captured the, the public's imagination in the way that it is today. And he's sort of the original pioneer of uh, a, lot of, a lot of our understanding of what lives around us or underneath us. And finally, we at Xerces are working on a new program around soil life and soil animals called Farming with Soil Life. We have a new publication which will be available as a free download here in about a month on our website. So if you're interested in in-depth profiles of all of these different um, animals that I touched on, plus, you know, 75 others, 
uh, you might check this out. And we will have a series of online courses, including some in the Midwest coming up over the next three years, which will cover the, the biology and life cycle and diversity of soil life. It will include uh, a, it will include sections on how to manage for soil biodiversity. It will include um, trainings in conducting that soil scouting protocol and different, different systems for sampling the organisms or extracting the organisms that live in soils to be able to, to view them under a microscope. So there's uh, a lot in development that is a, almost ready for launch and please stay tuned and stay connected if you're interested in that. So that is what I've got here. I wanted to, to, it looks like we're at time. I wanted to see if there are a few questions that we could um, tackle before the next presentation. Yes, Eric, can I just say um, thank you for your expertise, but mostly for your appreciation of bugs. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's why we're all here. And it's great to see all these people that are watching about bugs. We're just shy of 300 fellow warriors in this webinar. Um, so here's a question for you. How can one practice soil regeneration in a small community garden plot that's been used over and over? And can they incorporate cover crops as well? You, you absolutely can. I cover crop my own um, kitchen garden, which is 12 by 12. Um, so you absolutely can. And uh, I would check out that cover crop guide for some ideas, but this is, it's a fairly common development, I think now to see people even cover cropping very, very small raised beds um, and good practice generally overall. I think the, the use of cover crops combined with um, compost, combined with uh, reduced, um, it's funny, we don't think about tillage in the context of a raised bed, but um, I think minimizing the, the constant disturbance of that soil as well can can help foster more of these animals within it. Let's see if we can get uh, one or two more in, Eric. Um, can you say a little bit about earthworms and in particular, if you're familiar with the driftless region, the um, glaciers went through and how that might have affected earthworms? I, I don't know much. Uh, you know, again, there were historically no native earthworms in most of the, the central United States. And um, although the driftless area, um, you know, has, has periodically escaped um, some of the glaciation going back over the eons, um, much of the continent at one point or another has been covered with, with ice. Uh, the, Earth, the native earthworms that I know about um, are those found in the Pacific Northwest, and even those are fairly cryptic animals and ones that we know very little about. Um, the Palouse Prairie in eastern Washington, for example, was known to have um, what were called the giant earthworms, which were in fact um, giant earthworms, although not 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 uh, many feet in length, but quite a bit larger than a typical earthworm. But we know very, very little about even those. And um, this is, I, I believe in the driftless area, even there were, there were historically no native earthworms that were present there. Eric, can you say just a little bit about um, the quote, jumping worms that are all the rage these days? <laughs> I. I don't, I have to plead ignorance. I know nothing about the jumping earth. <laughs> something tells me that's a, that, that Sarah would know something about that. All right, we'll have to bring that back later. All right, here's, here's one more for you. Um, and it's kind of a general insect species question, but we have some folks with us today from Canada and um, all around the United States. Can you 
talk a little bit about overlap in insect species? Yeah, so what's interesting is that um, oftentimes species can be very limited in their, their geographic distribution. And yet at a, a functional group or a related group level, we've got fairly uniform distribution across the United States and um, across, across North America. So for example, uh, I, I thought it was interesting, Heather tackled the question of osmia in Minnesota. And in the Northwest here, we are a landscape that is really rich in osmia, the, the wood nesting groups of bees. Um, and in Minnesota, you know, we, there, are, there are completely different um, osmia in most cases, but they are still at, at a genus level, this, the group is, um, is spread across both parts of the continent. And we see that same trend, you know, the, the soldier beetles that you might find in uh, the Eastern US may be different than some of the soldier beetles you find in the Western US, but there are soldier beetles in both parts of the continent. continent. The same with predatory ground beetles and these seed feeding beetles. So I think it's oftentimes valuable to, to focus on conservation at a functional group level rather than a species level. Species driven conservation can be really valuable where we know there's an imperiled species, something that needs our attention and, and could use targeted conservation. But doing general habitat restoration work, I, I think there's a strong argument to be made for looking at how you fill the different niches or different ecological roles. And those roles are oftentimes um, pretty similar from place to place. Those are great words of wisdom to end on, Eric. And thank you so much for your time. With the summit, we strive to share innovative tactics and tools for best practices from experts in the field. Our overall goal is to protect and restore pollinators through conservation and the restoration of biodiversity. 